do a rack of pork. Very often you see these larger cuts of meat and it's kind of intimidating. You're not sure what to do with it, right? This is so easy. Everything I need is in these three little cups over here. And this is a full rack. This is a half of a pig's worth of pork chops. And all I've done really is blot this off with paper towels and just line the sheet pan with parchment paper. If you wanted to, you could slice through here a little bit, get two of these, tie them together, and that's all there is to a crown roast of pork. It's really that simple. It's just pork chops. Now, these are not like diner pork chops, um, which are sliced very thin. So you're, you're going to have eight ribs on any rack of pork, and that is eight full servings of pork because these are going to be really thick. Um, this is going to be juicy and tender and wonderful, best pork chops you've ever had in your life. It's so simple to put together. Because all we're going to put on here is this is just a mixture of salt and pepper. Now the main thing when you're doing this sort of thing is make sure you're seasoning the whole piece of meat. We're not just going to season one side. Um, you know, the side that's sticking up. We're going to do the sides, we're going to do the back, everything. The other thing I have here is just some freshly chopped thyme. Just kind of sprinkle that around and then rub it in. You're just going to kind of rub everything into the meat. And then finally I have some finely chopped fresh garlic. And again, we're just going to kind of rub that in. Now, if you wanted to get fancy, you could French down those bones a bit, clean them off. But um, honestly, I'd rather have the meat on the bone. It's tasty. And, you know, one thing we're going to do is cook this on a fairly low heat. So I have my oven preheating to 325 degrees. Because what you don't want to happen, which you'll get with a higher temperature, is to have the meat on the outside cooked, but not on the inside. And so... You know, you might want that if you were doing a prime rib and you want it really red in the middle, but for a pork roast, we want it to be reasonably um, evenly heated, although, you know, modern pork, you know, commercially produced in America, there is no trichinosis, so you do not have to cook it as much as you did once. Um, and I'm going to attempt this before I take it out of the oven, and when we get there, I'll show you, but, um, you know, I'm looking for somewhere between 150 to 155 degrees when I take it out of the oven. And then we're going to let it to set for a good half hour, and the temperature will come up a bit more. It'll be more like 160 degrees once everything's said and done. But if you let it get all the way to 160 before you take it out of the oven, you might end up with some dry overcooked pork by the time it's rested and you're slicing and serving it. And that's, that's true with um, you know anything that you bake in the oven, and especially larger pieces of meat, is once you take them out, they continue to cook. So now we've got this seasoned all over the place really nicely. And I've got just a little bit of garlic left, so we're going to toss that on the top. And I have a little bit of time left, but not much, so we're going to go ahead and toss that on the top. If I had a lot of time and garlic left, I'd just hold them aside and I'd use them in the sauce later, but this will all come together. And that's it. So this is going to go in the oven, and I'm going to cook it um, near the bottom of the oven at 325, probably about two hours. But we'll temp it, and that'll tell, you know, each piece of meat's different, and your oven may be different than mine, so we'll temp it, and that'll really tell us what time it needs to come out. Once it's ready, I will tell you how long it was actually in the oven. And that's it. It's that easy. So to go with our roasted pork loin today, we're going to make scallop potatoes. This is a very easy dish that everybody likes. And, you know, you don't have to go buy one of those really expensive boxes um, with the desiccated potatoes in them, you know. So, you know, potatoes are really cheap and really easy to use. I have some setting here in a bowl of cold water, and I've just peeled them and sliced them to about a quarter of an inch thick. And, you know, my Irish friend who hates to cook told me, and I've found this to be true over the years, you can leave those sliced up peeled potatoes in that cold water covered in the refrigerator for up to a week, and they'll still be good. Really? So, yeah, so don't worry if you make a few too many or whatever, just keep them. They don't get mushy? Nope. As long as they're sitting in water, they're really good for at least several days. I don't think I've ever had potatoes last in my house a week, but um, I have had them last for three or four days, and they're no problem whatever. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, you don't want to forget to put them in the fridge or anything, and they must be covered with water. Anything that's sticking up above the water line is going to turn pink and brown on you, so that's no good. Does it soak up water? Do they soak um, the water up? Not too much, really, because they're already high in water content. And so what I'm doing here is I'm going to make the sauce for our scallop potatoes. And I've just taken about three tablespoons of butter, which is about an ounce and a half, and I'm just melting it. And I'm actually going to turn my heat up just a little bit here, because we don't want to wait all day. 
and um, I'm going to put about an equal amount of flour in here once the butter is melted. And for those of you that have been, you know, watching the show know this is going to be called a roux, and then we're going to turn it into a bechamel. Once again, about the most versatile white sauce on the planet. And what we're going to do today is we're going to add just a little bit of nutmeg, which actually I'll just add to the butter right now. And that's about a quarter of a teaspoon of nutmeg. This is something you want as a flavor in the background. You don't want it to be dominant, you know. So don't go too heavy on the nutmeg. Don't get carried away with that. And so now our butter's completely melted, and I'm going to start to add flour. Now, I haven't sifted this or anything. You know, this is total simple farm cooking, right? Nothing fancy or complicated here. And you'll see it's getting kind of clumpy, but that's okay, because as it heats up, it's going to turn into a paste. And all those lumps will go away. Just kind of keep stirring is the secret. At this point, sometimes I use a um, whisk. But, you know, the whisk can't really get into the corners of this pot, so I just like to use a spatula for this. And we're going to go a little bit thicker than that, so I'm going to add a bit more flour. How much will this make? This is going to make quite a bit, and I'm really not sure how much milk we're going to use yet. Um, this should be good for at least a quart. I have four cups of milk measured out over here, and we may end up using a little bit more. It just depends on how tight our roux ends up getting. And you can see as you add more flour, you actually start to get rid of those lumps. And I'm feeling good about that now, so we're going to start to add milk. And you don't want to dump it in there all at once, then you will get lumps and it won't really come together nicely. So just a little bit. What kind of milk? Could you use like half and half? You know, like you can use whatever you want. I keep 1% in my house. Um, and you know, the roux is what's really going to thicken it, so you don't need to use cream or anything like that. Um, at the restaurant, we would probably use half milk, half, half, and half to, you know, just make it good and rich and creamy. But, um, you know, I usually use 1% at home. So now you can see it's mixed nicely. There's no lumps in there. It's just, you know, kind of all come together. And um, once this milk heats up, this will really thicken up, and then we'll start to add more milk. I'm adding dried chives today because I like them. In fact, we can go ahead and add those at this point. Let them cook a little, although by the time the potatoes come out of the oven, they'll be fine. So I have about a quarter cup of dried chives here. My chives out on the patio are looking pretty sad right now. It's January in Oregon, and they've been frozen a couple of times. And I think I'm going to add the whole quarter cup, looking at that, because I really like chives. And I can see my sauce is starting to thicken again. I can see the bottom of the pot. So it's time to add some more milk. And I'm just going to add the rest of this. So what I've had here is um, four cups or one quart of milk. And that was to a roux. We started with about three tablespoons of butter. Now, you, don't, you do want this to actually be a little saucier and you know, looser than you think because when you put it on the potatoes and you bake them for an hour, um, you know, it's all going to thicken up from the starch in the potatoes. So if you put your sauce there into the potatoes as thick as you thought you wanted it to end up, you would end up with really sort of gummy, pasty, scallop potatoes. And we want them to be real saucy, right? And at this point, um, we want to add some salt and pepper. And really, this is to taste. But what I will tell you, two things. I'm going to use white pepper because I'm using a white sauce, and I have it, but... If you wanted to use black pepper in there, it's no big deal. With white pepper, you want to go a little easy because it's a lot hotter than black pepper. I don't know if that's the peppercorn itself or because it's ground so much more fine, but I do know that white pepper will end up being hotter than um, black so pepper. It's just regular pepper just grind up really well? No, it's actually a white peppercorn. Oh. But um, I don't know if it's because of that or because of how finely they grind it or both. It could be a combination of the two but I know it's just easy to overdo white pepper. And then I'm going to use kosher salt, and we're going to put probably about a good tablespoon in there, honestly, because this is going to go on potatoes, and it can be quite bland if you don't make it pretty salty. So a little, when you taste it, it should be a little bit saltier than you think you want it, because once the potatoes cook with it and soak it all up, it's really going to eat a lot of that salt. And you don't want to serve bland scallop potatoes. On the other hand, you know, you're not trying to make it like the ocean or anything. 
<laughs> You're not trying to hurt people. And I'm just going to get a spoon out and give it a little taste. And taste stuff when you're cooking, people. <clears throat> Even just a tiny bit more salt. <clears throat> now, so about a teaspoon and a tablespoon is what I've added here. Because it looks like you took a ton of salt in there. I know. You know, when you see it on the camera and it's going through the light, it just looks like a ton of salt. But it was about four teaspoons or one tablespoon and a teaspoon. And that's going to be for a full pan of potatoes. Now what I've done for the potatoes, I just have a um, pan that I've sprayed with pan spray. I use 100% canola oil, but whatever you've got. And um, you know, you can always use canola oil in a paper towel to grease your pans too. You don't need to have spray. And um, I've taken four large Idaho potatoes. Um, Idaho potatoes or baker potatoes are going to work better for you that, for this than say a red or a yellow potato because um, they have more starch in them so they're just better for this sort of dish whereas if you were frying them or roasting them in the oven then you'd want a red or a yellow potato because they're more of a waxy potato. So this has come up to a simmer now and I can just you know start to see it starting to thicken a little bit so that's going to be just about perfect I think. I'm going to let it come up to a bit of a boil so we can really see it but it looks just about perfect to me. There we go. Yeah. So that's going to be just perfect and that was four cups of milk we ended up putting in there. So one thing I'd like to point out is the reason we put the pork roast in first and then started the potatoes is because the pork roast is going to take about two hours and the potatoes need to bake for about an hour. So by the time you make your sauce, you peel and slice your potatoes and then you cover them and get them in the oven they're going to come out at a really, you know, about the same time. So you, you don't end up serving one cold while you're waiting for the other one to, you know, finish cooking. So that's why we've done that. And what we have is just simple Idaho potatoes. We've just peeled them and sliced them about a quarter of an inch thick. And we're just going to put down a layer. I'm going to pull them right out of the water. You don't need to drain them or anything. Because um, steam is part of what makes these cook so well anyway. So it all works out. And we're just going to put a good layer in the pan, and then we're going to put down some sauce, and so on and so forth, until we have as many potatoes in the pan as we want. And as I say, I didn't worry about how many I sliced up. I just kind of went for it. I sliced up four really large Idaho potatoes. And anything that's left over, I'll just use in something else later this week. Probably tomorrow, because we really like potatoes. But <laughs> Who doesn't? Yeah. Yeah, and potatoes, if you're trying to stretch the dollar and feed a family or whatever, I mean, potatoes are great because they're really cheap. So now I'm just going to ladle a little bit of sauce over them. And, you know, you could pour your sauce over the whole pan at the end. But, you know, I just think it's nice to put a little sauce on every layer. Somehow, in my mind, it keeps the potatoes from sticking together too much, but I don't even know if that's true. But the more, the better. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> now, at this point, I always sort of um, shimmy the pan a little, you know, make sure I get any air bubbles out, everything's covered nicely. You can see one little piece over there needs some sauce on it. And um, so I'm just going to cover this with aluminum foil, and this is going to go in the oven for about an hour. So normally I cook this dish at about 400 degrees, and today the oven's at 325 for the pork, so it may take longer. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in right now and give it a good hour and a half. We can always pull it out early. So how you're going to know it's done is I'm going to stick a fork in there, and when there's no resistance, when they're all tender in the middle, that's when they're done. And then you can just cover them right back up with your foil and let them set for probably close to an hour before they really start to cool down too much to serve. Our pork roast has reached 150 degrees and we've brought it out and we've been letting it um, just rest for about 20 minutes. And what I have in here is the drippings from the pan. And I just have it in one of those fat separating cups. And I'm just going to pour as much juice as we have in there and then hold back the stuff that's really just fat. Now, because there's not quite as much juice as I'd like for sauce, I'm going to add a little bit of chicken broth. And, you know, you can use whatever you have. You can use, um, you know, beef broth, pork broth, mushroom broth. Mushroom would be really good. 
and we're just gonna heat that up a bit now at this point if you wanted to you could um, you know you could use you could put cream in there thyme a bay leaf whatever you like and you know you could let it simmer the whole time the uh, roast was um, setting out and um, you know you could do anything you want but we're just gonna make a real simple sauce with the drippings and a little bit of chicken ju juice just to uh, you know round it out for us and we're just gonna bring that up to a boil so we just let our sauce simmer down a little bit and reduce and now I'm just gonna put a little bit of cornstarch with some cold water in it now when you're doing this there are a couple of things you need to know about using cornstarch to thicken a sauce the first one is that you do not put hot liquid into your cornstarch it'll just clot up and be a terrible mess the other one is when you're using your cold liquid it's really better to add the liquid to the cornstarch and stir it with a fork rather than try and add cornstarch to the liquid I don't know why it just sort of clumps up if you do so when you're using cornstarch to thicken those are the only things you need to know so while it's at a boil I'm just gonna add a little and give it a stir and when it's the thickness we want um, you know we'll just run the rest down the drain now you do need to let your sauce come back up to a boil before you'll know how thick it is and we're going to add just a teeny bit more and that'll do it because we're you know we're just looking for sauce we're not looking for a thick gravy here and that's it and that's our sauce done that'll go over our nice pork roast so here's our pork roast rack and it's rested for about half an hour so it's easy to handle and um, as you can see it's a beautiful golden brown color came out just beautifully and it's nice and pink so this is how pork should look when it's done when it's good pork it shouldn't be bleached out dry white meat and um, that's just a beautiful chop as you can see it's really thick that end piece and each one of these are going to be more than an inch thick because these are real full chops. These haven't been sawed in half while they were frozen or anything like that. And that's, that's how a real pork chop should be. And then we're just going to pour a little sauce over the top. And that's just going to be a delicious plate. We have our scalloped potatoes, pork chop, and a little green salad just for fun.